All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. So welcome to Pivot's annual fundraiser, which this year is the launch of Pivot Science. I am Tara Lloyd, our executive director and our first employee from seven years ago. If this were a normal night for us with our annual fundraiser, we'd be gathered in person in New York and about to share an experience together. Uh, you'd hear the nervous excitement of our nurses and doctors gearing up to share their passion about the work, some tired from actually having traveled from Madagascar to be here, longtime Pivot supporters excited to learn something new and to see old friends, and brand new people to the Pivot community ready to learn what we're all about. I love those evenings. The food smells great. We'd be offering you a drink. There'd be Malagasy music in the background. And I love watching our scientists set up their posters and get ready to share their work. The sort of good old fashioned science fair part of the fun. I would be stepping into the bathroom to check my remarks one last time, take a deep breath and try to get ready to raise a fifth of our Malagasy, Madagascar operating expenses in one night. So this science fair fundraiser is always a very big deal for us. But nothing about 2020 has been normal, as we all know. So I just want to start by really deeply thanking you for showing up tonight as we try to pull this off virtually. We uh, ask for grace as we, we try to have all of the videos that we'd like to share and the clips from our scientists um, get pulled off in this new virtual world. Uh, but mostly I want to thank you for making room in your head and heart to turn your attention to people living on the other side of the world, but through this pandemic together. I believe that it is exactly the sort of empathy that you're showing right now, truly caring for neighbors near and far that will bring us through this year together. So thank you. And tonight is more than our normal science fair. It's about launching Pivot Science, a new unit within Pivot that we believe will take the integration of our mission of health equity and science to the next level. It's been years in the making and it's unique in many ways, which you'll hear all about this evening. And now more than ever, I think the world gets it, really understands what science brings to bear to problems like these, what modeling, vaccine development, prevention and treatment measures mean for all of us. COVID has laid bare our interconnectedness and our fragility. And at Pivot, we know that technological solutions aren't enough because they don't determine who has access to them and how they will be distributed. Together, Matt and I, with our incredible teams, believe that we can change that. For COVID-19, measles, plague, malaria, whatever pandemic is to follow, we believe it will not be over anywhere until it is over everywhere. Our mission to alleviate suffering, unnecessary suffering in Madagascar might sound idealistic, but the way that I like to think about it is, Idealism inspires and science enables. Matt, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Tara. Uh, let's see if I can get the first part of this thing right by sharing my screen. Tara, can you see this? Okay, so far so good. Okay. So. Yeah, so first, uh, thanks again for for joining us today. This is um, the pivot community in particular is a very close community. Just looking at the participant list, you know, um, you all are our friends and our family and have most of you have been with us from the very beginning. So there are pieces of this story that are not going to be new. Um, and there's some that I think will be new. And so, um, so in particular, I just um, we want to take this moment and the moment in the universe, <laughs> uh, which is something of a strange scientific crisis on one hand, not knowing the role of science in solving new problems and also uh, an age old issue of, of uh, how do we actually solve uh, some of the most basic problems that the world faces. <clears throat> so those are very close to us now uh, with COVID and the pandemic. Um, but they've also, for those of us who have been working in Madagascar and countries like Madagascar, these are the issues that we face every year. Madagascar deals with epidemics of that sort all of the time, not just actual, the literal plague, measles epidemic, and then actual malaria epidemics that are happening annually. So this is a familiar and uncomfortable territory, and it uh, certainly increases the demand for, for the right kind of science that solves real problems for people. <clears throat> so um, by way of introduction, in terms of what pivot science is all about and what we see as the opportunity to sort of advance the human rights agenda pivot, 
I wanted to take a step back and give you a little bit of a background on my own history and journey and how I got here. So before Pivot started, I was working and living in, in Rwanda uh, at a very special time, starting about 15 years ago. And um, this was uh, about a decade after its genocide during a time of really important recovery for the country of Rwanda, and also a time when the world was starting to tackle really big problems like the HIV pandemic, completely for the, in a new way that they had never done before. And there was a renewed commitment. So the Millennium Development Goals were set. <clears throat> Huge international entities, new entities like the Global Fund to fight HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria were set up. <clears throat> and in places like Rwanda, uh, uh, there is true transformation happening. <clears throat> so I lived there on the hospital campus in Rinkwavu uh, at Partners in Health. And Rwanda at the time was kind of the poster child for development. It was seeing some of the fastest drops in child mortality on record. It was seeing a year after year of uh, rapid economic growth. And where we saw these kinds of transformations happening more than anywhere else on that, in that country was, um, was in Partners in Health sites. So Partners in Health was the largest non-governmental healthcare provider in the country. So we were witnessing, I was witnessing, I went from a, an, a high schooler hearing about the Rwanda genocide to being out of graduate school and seeing what seemed like miracles occurring, right? So one year, you know, there'd be a place where there, there was need a HIV patients not getting treated next year there's a fully functioning hospital right we go to a health center that was completely it was the uh, dilapidated or almost inoperable a low staff and then the next year it's functioning and this is happening across the country and where I was in particular <clears throat> and we we had set while we were there to um, take these lessons that Partners in Health was setting with the government of Rwanda and try to develop an evidence base for how you actually transform health systems. And what I found in that experience uh, was just overwhelming frustration. I had um, two PhDs at the time, a PhD in economics and a PhD in ecology, particularly infectious disease ecology. I, had, I was quite well-trained actually <clears throat> in quantitative methods of various kinds. And, uh, I didn't know how to help. I didn't, like the kind of data systems that were in place, the kind of problems that were being faced, those were not problems that I was trained to deal with. <clears throat> and this had me feeling not disillusioned, but really frustrated with science and academia in general. We, we were not learning how to solve problems. So, <clears throat> um, and this is juxtaposed with the situation that while great things were happening, the evidence base for how they're supposed to have, how they're happening, what's transferable, what are the lessons, that was thin, right? So we didn't actually know how big of an impact Partners in Health was having in the communities at that time. Partners in Health did not have a baseline study at that time. We we're retrofitting these data sets. So this juxtaposition between this enormous information gap and this enormous misalignment of, of training um, was just my identity for, for more than, for like a decade, half a decade. So um, I had like, I had to learn to unlearn. I had to unlearn what I had been learning uh, and put my training aside and try to learn from people who, who seemed like they knew what they were doing. And one of those people was Dr. Michael Rich. She was a national director of Partners in Health at the time. He's future uh, founder of Pivot. And another one is Agnes Pinaguajo, the uh, minister of health at the time was one of my formal mentors. <clears throat> Um, and at this time, when I was living in Rwanda, I met Jim Hernstein. And uh, I actually met him while I was on a trip in New York, uh, of all things, in a cafe. Um, and he told me this incredible story about work that he and Robin had been doing um, in, su in support with uh, Pat. And he told me I didn't know of Pat Wright at that time, but that she was a, this Jane Goodall type character of, of lemurs. Um, that uh, Ronald Fauna National Park was a spectacular, magical place, and they'd formed these incredible relationships with the community, and they're doing really important, great work, and that they were interested in the role of science and supporting those goals. And Jim came to ask me, among the many other things, he asked, what do I think about, um, about their intentions? They had supported uh, at a new research facility with an infectious disease lab. At, many of you are familiar with that, at Center Valbio. 
And when I think about that, I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. I love this. I love national parks and lemurs and rainforests. And, uh, and I'm sick of science not helping people. And uh, it doesn't automatically work. And he said, I know. Can you help? And I said, actually, I don't think I can yet. I'm not learning. But I, I know people who, who can. And so let's figure this out. And so um, this is my way of introducing. So we agreed to go to Rana Mafana uh, to visit Mad go to Madagascar. And um, not so late after that, my, Dr. Michael Rich and I. And um, we landed in Madagascar. And I met someone who was a scientist of like mind. And actually, I met a couple. One of them is. Pat Wright and the other is Benjamin. So Benjamin has some thoughts he'd like to share with you all, but let me just give you my quick introduction. Oh, before I do that, let me just, sorry. Um, most of you know, I think all of you know that, that Madagascar is off the coast of Africa. And that thing on the far right that you see here is not Madagascar. That's actually a finally Dean district where we work. And at the far left is Rana Mafana right here, far west of this Fondine district. And sometimes we'll use the word Ramaphana referring to a park, sometimes refer it as a commune where our headquarters is, which is part of the district of the Fondine that we're in. This is Benjamin Andre Miaha. Benjamin is probably the person, the single person most responsible for pivot starting off on the right foot. He's a scientist, PhD in, in geochemistry. <clears throat> he, he literally held our accounting books, procurement, logistics, he is like a godfather and also like an uncle to the staff of our organization. So and he's also one of our board members. So he's going to tell you his story um, uh, of how we got started. Hi, I am Dr. Benjamin Andrea Mihadza, and I am a member of the Pivot Board. I am a scientist and the founder and director of Madagascar Institute for the Conservation of Tropical Ecosystems. I also work closely with Centre Valbio, one of the people's primary partners as their country director. I was the first coordinator for Ranmafan National Park and worked alongside park founder Dr. Patricia Wright in the early 90s to establish the park to protect thousands of endemic animals. Over my years of involvement with the national park and the science that it generates, I come to realize something. There is no such thing as a healthy national park without healthy local people. And there can be no healthy local people without a healthy national park. The two are inseparable. The moment I realized this was the moment that I realized that I had to strive to find a healthcare solution that worked for local people if I was to help the country and the forest that I love. This epiphany might have come to nothing had I not met Jim and Robin Herstein, two of the Pivot's co-founders, during their first visit to Madagascar in 2010. They came to visit Centre Valbayo to learn more about the decades of scientific research it had spearheaded because, like Pat and me, they are scientists. And like Pat and me, and so many others who see the forest, they immediately knew that it has to be preserved. But they also saw that this beauty exists side by side with some of the worst poverty in the world. Communities adjacent to the park were in a precarious situation, trapped in a vicious cycle of economic instability, underfunded education, and lack of access to even basic health care. The problem was clear, but the solution was not. What was needed was a scientific approach creative and evidence-driven intervention that brought modern solution to a generational problem. Myself, along with Pat, Robin, and Jim, enlisted Dr. Matt Mons and Dr. Michael Rich so that we could leverage to Madagascar their experience of healthcare system strengthening with partner in health. However, like hiking through the dense forest, making progress on this shared vision was difficult. Let me tell you a story that illustrates the challenge that we face. During our first group outing to visit a local health facility, we visit Radmafan, which would eventually become home to Pivot's flagship model health center. When we got there, we found a young girl of maybe eight or nine years old lying in the bed 
She had a cerebral malaria, but it was not being treated. It was clear that she will soon be dead. Let me be clear. The problem was not in understanding what her condition was. We and the local doctor knew. The problem was also in knowing that treatment she needed to recover. We have known that quinine treats malaria since 17th century. No, the problem was that the quinine and IV bags that would have been administered within minutes in the West was not available to the local healthcare system and the family could not even afford the few dollars it would take to buy it at the private pharmacy. For the little girl, the story had a happy outcome. We realized that we had to act immediately, took her and her father from the health center to the local pharmacy to buy quinine and IV bag. Then we brought her to the hospital. She had recovered in two days using less than $5 of supplies and medical knowledge that is 400 years old. So we ask ourselves with all the urgency that this incident distills in us, how do we solve this problem? We knew that simple solutions were not reaching the people that needed them. We decided that an NGO should be started, the NGO that would later be named Pirot. We presented this vision to the various local, regional and national Ministry of Health officials, and I am glad to say there was a great deal of interest. The local authorities were aware about the problem and were keen to try out innovative solutions. They shared our passion for change and just need the expertise to make it as a reality. This is where pivot science can make a difference. While buying some quinine and IV bag might solve the immediate symptom, it doesn't treat the underlying condition. What is needed is comprehensive, connected and up-to-date scientific understanding of the comorbidity of the disease, the transmission vectors that make it so prevalent, the specific strain of malaria that is present locally, and all the other details knowledge that is required to develop a truly tailored and efficient medical response. This is what pivot science seeks to bring in Madagascar. So, there's a few really important points that Benjamin was sharing that I just want to reiterate. The first is that this kind of commitment for, science, for a scientific approach to these problems. But the second, and the more important one is that the that the problems that we're seeing, the problem of the girl that he was mentioning, those that do not appear to be scientific problems, right? This we have we have solutions, as Benjamin said, in some cases that are 400 years old and they weren't reaching her. And so as a result, um, we're seeing uh, a lot of unnecessary deaths. So after Pivot started, we had done a baseline study and we we learned that in the Fonadine district in 2014, that one in seven children were dying before they were five years old for treatable illness, almost all of it treatable illness. So malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia. One in 14 women were dying in childbirth. So this is, this is almost 15 years after the Millennium Development Goals were declared. This is well after the world had mobilized around a lot of solutions. Uh, there's, this does not undermine the, the importance and value of the potential of science, but it raises some really basic questions, which is how do we solve these basic problems? So this is a, a well-established question in global health. I would say it's the unifying question. It's, you know, um, the unifying question is why, when solutions are known and affordable at scale, do solutions not reach people? So as the former director of the World Health Organization said, there's a gap between today's scientific advances and their implementation, between what we know and what's actually being done. <clears throat> so this is known uh, even more commonly in our space as the no-do gap. <clears throat> and the answer to this, the ex our explanation for this is that, well, even simple solutions, even medicines for malaria, uh, require complex Delivery systems require complex health systems. And so we, so for a girl like who we'd run into and run a Mafana health center uh, during that visit, for her to get treated, she needs to have access to the actual health facility, 
the supply of drugs needs to be at the facility, the healthcare provider needs to be present and motivated, uh, financial barriers need to be removed, and all of that has to happen at once, at that moment where the person gets sick and needs care. So complex systems is something that's actually of intellectually a little bit more of a familiar topic for me. We have complex systems actually all around us. And the fact that it's complex doesn't mean that we can't be scientific about that. Some of you might have thought, have imagined yourself that you, that there's a difference between the forest and the trees, for example. Developmental biology, human biology, individual organisms are, are highly complex, are truly complex systems. Economies are complex systems. And they mean something specific, which is the whole is different than the sum of the parts. <clears throat> So what can, we do, what can we do in light of the fact that the simple problems, simple solutions aren't reaching people, and the, and, the, and the problem of that, a problem of that is the actual complexity of the system itself, the challenges of solving the system itself. On the one hand, this sounds like a very big, complicated problem. On the other hand, I actually think it's not that complicated. Model systems are a really important part of the solution. <clears throat> So some of you may know Mark Krasnow. He's the chair of the board at Center Val Bio. He's one of my intellectual heroes. He is the world, one of the world's leading experts on model organisms. And he points out that when he was in graduate school, most of the biggest problems in biology were thought to be insoluble because they were wickedly complex. How does, how does a, a single fertilized egg get to become a fully functioning, complex organism. How do you understand that? And when he was growing up, <clears throat> he was getting educated, they were, it wasn't even obvious they could solve them. And what was the answer to that? Model systems. As he says, through model systems, most major questions in developmental biology that are thought to be insoluble are now actually solved. There's two types of models that are interesting here. So one is the concept of a, of, of a model organism type. That, uh, uh, a, a small version of something bigger that has fundamental qualities that we can understand rigorously and methodically and it has some properties that share with other systems. That's a really important concept here. Something that we can systematically study carefully to understand what's going on. And the other, of course, is what we might more naturally use in, in the language of global health, which is like a prototype, something that can be replicated. So Pivot is doing both. Both are really important. In order to develop the prototype, we need to understand the problems that we actually don't fully understand, or at least we have not fully understood. So that's the logic behind our concept of a model health district. <clears throat> so this is a Fonadine district. The way that we turn this into an actual replicable model that we can learn from is three key pieces. One is its design, the other is the delivery, and the other is the data. We do this together well across the system iteratively we will we, we we will learn how to actually improve the system and so today most of today what i want to do is show you that this is not a crazy idea in fact it is demonstrating some of the most important results that are out there in the world now so this is why we're creating the organization Pivot Science, because we do need both. We need the implementation in the routine data systems, and we need the scientific uh, universe um, corralled around this. So if now I want to talk to you a little bit about the, what it means to have a district level model health system. And to do that, to start us, we'll, um, I'll introduce Laura Codier. So Laura has been with Pivot for a very long time. She was a second hire. She was hired before the organization had feet on the ground. She was the head of monitoring and evaluation. And, um, and she has a lot of really great qualities. She's been the national director for about a year now or so, a little longer than that. Uh, and there's one quality that I like the most in her. And that is something that Ophelia Dahl pointed out is essential for a great leader. For those of you who don't know Ophelia Dahl, she's, the, she's one of the founders of Partners in Health and CEO and chair of their board for quite a long time. What does Ophelia say it takes to be a good leader? The ability to love complexity. The people who really succeed are those who say, bring it on, let's do this, and who have the versatility and nuance to navigate complexity. Laura knows how to do that better than almost anyone that I know, certainly better than me, and so we'd like to hear her talk about what a complex health system is. 
My name is Laura Cordier. I'm Pivot's National Director based here in Renomafana, Ifanadine District, Madagascar. As you've already heard, Pivot has been working in Ifanadine District since 2014. For the last six years, we've been working to strengthen the public health system of Ifanadine District, a district that is about the size of Rhode Island, serving approximately 200,000 people. We believe in health as a human right. Our goal is to establish a scalable model at a district level. And our approach is based on three main components. One, improving access to essential services by improving quality of care to address people's most basic and necessary needs. Two, strengthening the capacity and the readiness of a health facility by working on infrastructure and providing basic equipment and improving the supply chain. Three, data, research, scientific innovation, which you're going to hear more about today. One thing that makes Pivot unique is that we work at all three levels of the public health system. This means we're working with community health workers at the community level, accompanying them in their day-to-day -day activities so that they can provide the most basic services to address the needs of their own communities as well as health centers where primary care takes place and we focus on child health, maternal health, as well as infectious diseases and the district hospital for more specialized care. So I'll give you an example of how this integrated system is so key and so important as we're talking about health system strengthening. I'm going to talk about the unfortunately all too common story of a malnourished child in Ronomafana or Ifanadine district. A parent notices that their child is sick. They can take him to the health facility. But imagine that they're living 10 kilometers away from the health facility. In this case, community health is most often the connection to the health system. A community health worker is going to go to their home and screen the child for malnutrition. If they see that the child is on the spectrum of severe acute malnutrition, they will refer that child to the health facility. Once at the health facility, the patient is going to be diagnosed officially and enter the malnutrition program, where they will be seen on a weekly basis and get treatment as well as social support throughout their care. If the child presents complications, he or she can be referred to the district hospital for more specialized care. This can last up to six to eight weeks. And then if the treatment is successful for the severe acute malnutrition with complication, the child goes back to the health facility to complete their treatment and fully recover to get back to the community. Our unique data system is composed of a dashboard that tracks about 800 indicators in real time. It allows us to work with the Minister of Health and understand what needs to be improved, help us create rapid feedback loops to address failures in the system, and immediately respond. So Laura just described the core of our model, right? So there's the fundamental crux of the actual intervention itself is that there's focus on clinical quality care, focus on system readiness uh, at the level of the facility, so infrastructure supply chain, and the third is data. So I want to talk a little bit about the data, which of course is like at the centerpiece of what the science aspect of is. So one form of data that she mentioned is, um, is the sort of standard routine data that are used by implementers themselves. So that is a combination of the health registry information, health management information systems, it's called, and um, other kinds of ME. So we have those uh, visually provided on dashboards that people are relying. <clears throat> so from the, should say, from the registry information, we know that we have supported over 500,000 uh, patients since the organization started. So uh, since that first girl we met uh, about seven years ago. <clears throat> so the first is the dashboard data produces information like that. The other really important and unique thing that we have at Pivot, as many of you know, is that we we have representative household data. So dashboard and health systems data reflects people who come into the system, are using the facilities, and they give you some understanding of what's going on with care. But they do not tell you 
who's not getting care and who is getting care, right? So in 2014, as we were getting started, we did a contract with the National Institute of Statistics, the same entity that does um, the, all the national surveys for tracking all the big development indicators. These are professionals that you can, we can use to compare data both in our district across the country and internationally. And we had two clusters, one an intervention area and the other is a comparison area. And we collected that information over time, all of the key indicators such as treatment rates, whether people are sick and getting care, and tracking mortality rates, maternal mortality, infant mortality, child mortality. Um, and overall, there were amazing outcomes across the board. Um, and uh, with an early publication in the British Medical Journal Global Health, and it showed some, of, some robust evidence across particularly indicators around coverage. Um, and then also indicators around under five mortality. So this is the change in under five mortality rate compared to our intervention area. Uh, and what you can see is it dropped significantly in, in our area. So about 20% uh, about in the first two years. <clears throat> so we were pretty excited, actually. Infant mortality had dropped even faster. Maternal mortality had been dropping. But that's actually not what I want to talk about here, right? We don't need science to demonstrate things that already work. We, we need science to help us understand what doesn't work and to fix it, right? We need to answer questions that we have. And so I want to talk a little bit more today about, about what we didn't know and how to fix it. And so one thing that we discovered is that after those first two years, under five mortality stopped declining. Now the difference in differences is between our intervention area and the comparison area, that didn't narrow. Um, but we didn't know what to make of that, right? So our programs were going, lives had been saved, but that had changed. And we don't know the answer to that. Is it because of malaria, epidemic malaria that happened? Is it because of the measles outbreak that occurred? You know, as it turns out, the world actually doesn't have any evidence anywhere, a statistically significant difference in differences of under five mortality from a regional thing. So this is a big, important question of what can happen locally. So to answer that, we decided we needed a lot more information on who is getting care and who is not getting care. And so with that, I want to introduce Dr. Felina Ihantamala. So she is a health geographer. Uh, who is not only a postdoc with working with Pivot, she's actually now a postdoc working at Harvard Medical School with me. And she did an incredible study. So let me just allow her to explain uh, what her work was. Hi, my name is Phil Nayanta Malal. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and have been working on the Pivot research team since 2018. My academic training is in geometrics and health geography, and my primary research interests are dynamics of malaria and access to healthcare in rural areas. I most recently authored a paper called Improving Geographical Accessibility Modeling for Operational Use by Local Health Actors, in which we developed very precise, context-specific estimates of geographic accessibility to care in rural Ifanadin district in order to help with the design and implementation of interventions that improve access to care for remote populations. In this study, we mapped all buildings, all footpaths, and all residential areas throughout Ifanadin district. These data are freely available on OpenStreetMap. Then, we estimated the shortest routes and predicted travel times from every household in the district to the nearest primary health care facility and community health site. Finally, we integrated this result on geographical accessibility into an e-health platform developed with our Shiny, which means our findings can be used similarly to something like Google Maps to identify the most direct route between any two points in the district. <clears throat> I don't know if you caught what she just said, but Felina just said, she actually didn't specify it. Donna and team went across the district, tracked every footpath in the entire district, in a, in a district that only has a couple main roads. Most people are traveling by, by footpath. Geolocated every structure, hundreds of thousands, 150,000 structures, including individual houses, over 20,000 footpaths, and then timed, uh, measured the time it takes to get from any two places in the district based on 
um, the use of uh, software called humanitarian, crowdsourcing software of humanitarian street map. So this ended up becoming, I think, the richest database that we have anywhere on a health district. Um, what she also didn't say is that she then combined that with hundreds of thousands of patient records so that we know exactly how long it takes for people all over the district to get from any, any two points, including their house and the community health site and their house and the health center. And that becomes fundamental to our understanding of who's getting care and who's not getting care. So for that, she received a, quite, a, quite a big honor, it was the, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean uh, Global Health Conference. She's the first um, non-French um, native uh, to receive um, uh, the general award for her work on these geographic accessibility modeling. <clears throat> So I just mentioned that what we did is combined with we and her uh, did is combine that geographic information with patient records so that we knew how everyone in the district could access care. So this is a maps the network of individual Tokantani villages to every health center. Um, and we were able to use that to show <clears throat> um, exactly who's getting care over time. So this is uh, an animation, some of you may have seen this before, what it does is it shows um, per capita utilization rates from every Fokantani, every, every cluster of villages in the district um, at the local health facility. And if, you're, if you watch it closely, this is happening every month, if you watch it closely, you'll see a pattern emerge. And I'm gonna just show you what that pattern is um, very explicitly. <clears throat> it's a really simple pattern, a really important one. This is the pattern. <laughs> what you see here is that um, this is health facility utilization on the, on the y-axis and the distance to the health facility on the x-axis. And when Pivot started, most people, even very close to the health facility for their health facility, were, actually, were, were accessing care less than one time per year, but a half time per year. Over time, what you see is that those who lived really close to the facility were accessing care all, regularly. Those who are more than five kilometers uh, were, were only accessing healthcare facilities every, every couple of years. So here we are. This is data. Pivot had been working for several years now as these data are being collected. We had strengthened the facilities. We had eliminated user fees. We had helped, helped the government staff to norms. And, and even then, households who lived more than five kilometers are not actually ac accessing care. So we've actually done quite a lot of other modeling around this, but just to give you a, just a general overview of what, the, what that all means, it, it really it has one implication, that's the health system, even if it's staffed to norms, even if it's implemented according to what the Ministry of Health would hope for, it's not designed to reach everyone in a country where the majority of people live more than five kilometers. So this puts us back to the drawing board. What do we do with this information? Well, the answer is obviously, one answer is if people can't access health, the health system and the health system needs to access the population. So we have, um, some of you have made, heard before, we reached out to our partners around the world. Uh, there's something called the Community Health Impact Coalition that we are a part of. Uh, we have wonderful colleagues in Togo and Mali, Muso and Integrate Health among others partners in health included, uh, who had very interesting community health models, and we partnered with them around how we might be able to do that kind of work with the government in Madagascar. So with that, I'll introduce Lantu Rolanta Malala, who is our community health manager. Um, she has a, num a lot of wonderful characteristics. I've known her from, for a very long time. So I spend, um, every time I'm in Madagascar, I spend time with her and their group on these community health walks. And one thing that she does more than this about anything else is she walks a lot. And here she is talking to you about the community health design. Bonjour, je m'appelle Marva Vrelant Malal. Je suis sage-femme et j'ai commencé avec PIVO en 2014. Aujourd'hui, je suis superviseur communautaire. Je suis en charge de la planification et du suivi des activités communautaires. Dans le district de Fanadine, où Pivo travaille, plus de 75% des personnes vivent à plus d'une heure en marche d'un centre de santé. C'est pourquoi les agents de santé communautaire sont essentiels 
pour apporter des services de soins de santé de base aux habitants de ces communautés éloignées. À partir du moment où PUVO a lancé le projet de soins proactifs dans la commune de Ramofan, le projet comprenait des initiatives clés. Premièrement, l'introduction des soins proactifs où les gens de santé communautaire font des maisons à maison dans la communauté pour fournir des services de santé. Et deuxièmement, la professionnalisation des chansons communautaires. Dans le cadre du modèle de soins proactifs, un agent communautaire fait la visite à domicile de tous les ménages dans son secteur en faisant la sensibilisation, en offrant des soins aux enfants moins de 5 ans, aux femmes pour la planification familiale et sur la recherche des douceurs chroniques pour identifier le cas de tuberculose. Pour les cas hors de leurs compétences, les gens communautaires assurent la référence vers un centre de santé de base et le suivi du traitement des patients en vie ou référés. La professionnalisation des gens communautaires impliquait de recruter davantage de gens communautaires, de mettre en œuvre des horaires fixes pendant lesquels un agent communautaire devrait être disponible pour fournir des soins de payer un agent communautaire un salaire égal au salaire minimum à Madagascar et de développer un cadre de superviseurs dédiés qui se déplacent dans les communautés, soutiennent et évaluent un agent communautaire dans l'accomplissement de leurs tâches. Ce travail fait partie de notre initiative de couverture sanitaire universelle et fait partie d'une stratégie visant à fournir des soins à toutes les personnes du district. En se basant sur les résultats de ces six premiers mois de ce projet pilote que vous allez entendre plus tard, nous éteindrons le projet de santé communautaire à d'autres communes pour l'année prochaine. I hope you're tracking this pattern. There's a lot um, that we're saying. Uh, uh, this is very, but the pattern is really specific. Laura explained uh, a system level intervention, and I explained system wide population based outcomes, right? So we had a design and a delivery, and I explained some outcomes. And we saw problems and challenges and big questions about who is getting care and not getting care. And Felina uh, did a big ex exploration around the geography of care. <clears throat> that in turn led to a solution, a proposed solution, which is community health with a government to pilot. And we just heard from, from Lantu around what might, might be a truly workable solution. Of the things that I, I hope that you, you, cap, you caught, the first most important thing to note is that we're talking about full-time cohort of professional health workers who are community, based in the communities. They're true health system, integrated in health system, community health workers. They're paid a minimum wage. They're supervised regularly. They're capable of uh, supporting population where they are. And then that pilot just happened last fall. So it's our new initiative as we've been uh, iterating around the design of this model system. And sure enough, in that process, of course, it wouldn't be a true program if we didn't have data. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Benedict Raza Finjatu. So Benedict, like everyone we're showing, she's a very special person in the organization. She's also been with the Pivots since almost the beginning. She started off as an assistant in the modern evaluation team. She is now the director of modern evaluation, so she's replaced Laura. We haven't promised her that she can replace Laura as a national director, that would be very controversial, but she has those kinds of skills. So um, uh, one thing to say before she, is that she took this on, this work is integrated into her own graduate, uh, her own graduate work, and she's in, now intending to do a PhD around community health just from this work that she's just worked on in the past six months. Hi, my name is Benedict. I am the Director of Monitoring and Evaluation and Operational Research. Since March, I have been leading a study to evaluate the impact of the first six months of our Proactive Care Community Health Pilot Program. We started by conducting a rapid evaluation to determine the strengths 
and the area for improvement, the progress of implementation and the effectiveness of the project, relying on data that was already available via the Madagascar's health management information system, as well as private regular programmatic data collection. We evaluated the impact of the pilot on utilization of healthcare services by children under five, quality of care of services for sick children and measures of program fidelity. We also compared the Ramofan results with other communes receiving general pilot support and looked at before and after the introduction of the new approach. We found that during the six-month pilot period, community health workers in intervention commune completed over 3,000 visits with children under five, which translates to 3.4 visits per capita when analyzed. In other words, visit increased by almost 300% when we compare the numbers of visits during our study period and the same times the year prior. Of the visits completed by community health workers in intervention commune, 40% were proactive care visits at household. This tells us that providing proactive care for home visit is the key to ensuring the most rural populations have access to the health services they need. Despite the increase in workload, quality of care was high. We ensure correct care flow twice monthly supervision to observe how well were community health workers able to follow in the standard protocols for diagnosis and treatment of common illness like malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia in children under five. Our study showed that the rate of correct care increased from 32% in October 2019 to 94% in March 2020. At the three-month mark, we had a focus group with the community health workers to understand their experience and challenges. They told us that they appreciated the frequency of the supervision as it gave them an opportunity to ask questions and seek feedback. Overall, this evaluation was an important step in determining if a new community health program should be implemented in other communes in the district. So that was awesome. Um, so here we are trying to iterate around a program that works and in a relatively short period of time, we're determining what happens or what's happening at mortality rates, who's getting care and who's not getting care, upgrading uh, the, a community health program that we hope can scale across the country in collaboration with the government. And what she was showing you were three, th two important things. One is that utilization tripled in the, in the villages where our pilot new community health worker program was working. So three times as many children under five are getting treated for treatable illness than otherwise were getting treated before. And then the quality of care of the community health workers was, was rising significantly. So those are important developments for which we have an evidence base already to advance the program with the government. <clears throat> so that is essentially, that, that's what we would call pivot science, right? So asking the big questions about population level change, but also drilling into basic questions that where the data, where we're getting feedback from villages, the data are being collected in a real time to, to design, deliver, <clears throat> and evaluate. So that, that would normally be, we'd normally stop there and like we have uh, and talk about bells and whistles or data, but these aren't normal times. And there's happens to be one other unfortunate example of a kind of work that we're doing in pivot science. And that is, you guessed it, COVID-19 we're facing with right now. So we can't possibly conclude this without talking about the world's the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now, certainly affecting Madagascar as much as anywhere else in the world. So I'm gonna, uh, to do that, I'm gonna hand this over to um, Alicia Mayfield, who is our um, chief medical officer. 
My name is Alicia Mayfield. I'm a physician and I joined Pivot one year ago as the Chief Medical Officer. So I am excited to be here today to talk about one of our central goals at Pivot, which is to achieve universal health coverage in Ifana Dean District by the end of 2022. And while doing so, to create a roadmap for the national government so that they can take this program and scale it nationally. This is no small feat, but if there was ever a time that demonstrated the importance of an integrated, strong healthcare delivery system, that time is now. This is the first time in over 100 years that we have had a global pandemic like this. It's the first time in any of our lives that a new infectious disease has simultaneously hit every part of the world. And we're seeing firsthand just how interconnected we truly are. One of the most important lessons of the last few decades has been the need for resilient healthcare systems. This has been demonstrated time and again, whether it's with HIV, Zika, SARS, or most notably Ebola. A resilient healthcare system is one that can sustain shocks and continue to function, meeting the ongoing needs of people suffering from things like stroke, heart attack, pneumonia, or women going into labor, people needing surgery, while at the same time dealing with a new infectious disease. During the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, it's estimated that over 11,000 people died of Ebola. But at the same time, almost as many people, over 10,600 people, died of healthcare problems that were unrelated to Ebola, things like malaria, complications of pregnancy, et cetera, that went unaddressed because of the strain that Ebola put on the healthcare system. And after the epidemic ended, we saw large outbreaks of measles because children hadn't been vaccinated during that Ebola epidemic. So one of the key questions that we face currently at Pivot and really around the world is how do you respond to an infectious outbreak while still keeping the healthcare system functional? And the answer is fundamentally the same, whether you're in the United States or you're in a rural part of Madagascar. You need to build a strong foundation in the healthcare system and then mobilize new resources to meet these new demands, while at the same time ensuring that ongoing healthcare delivery services remain intact. You need to make sure that there are services for those babies being born into the world, their mothers with asthma and their dads with diabetes, and really everything in between. And in Ifana Dean District, we spent years building up the healthcare system in partnership with the government. We already have a network of trained community health workers. We have primary care facilities that have the staff, equipment, and medications they need. We have a strong district hospital and we have an effective referral system complete with ambulances who can take people from one level of care to another. In addition, we've built that critical component that is often lacking in emergency response, and that's we've built real trust with the communities we serve. And this is a critical ingredient. At Pivot, I feel like we're currently living up to our name by rapidly reconfiguring our services and responding to this unfolding situation. In fact, we've already managed to source, ship, and distribute PPE to healthcare facilities across the Fund and District in roughly the same amount of time it took to do this in the United States, which has a much stronger public health system and much stronger supply chain systems. We've trained people on how to use that PPE appropriately and how to safely identify cases of COVID. We've distributed tens of thousands of masks to the community, tripled the oxygen capacity at the hospital, and develop guidelines for how to safely reconfigure healthcare settings and also safely manage patients during this difficult time, whether they have COVID or something else. So I could talk at length about the myriad ways in which our team is supporting the government's COVID response in Madagascar right now, but I wanna go back to the fact that almost as many people died in West Africa from diseases unrelated to Ebola as they did from Ebola itself. This is really a shameful situation and it should never be repeated. If we learn from the past, it won't be. So right now at Pivot, that's what we're focused on. And fortunately, we already have the data feedback system already in place, which monitor when and where people aren't showing up for prenatal care appointments, childhood vaccinations, and other routine, but critically important healthcare services. And we're continually adapting and reconfiguring those services in order to provide safe, effective care to everyone in Ifana Dean in spite of this current crisis we're facing. And as we've seen before, it's during these times of crisis that a healthcare system is truly tested. And I'm very happy to say that our team is effectively moving the needle on healthcare delivery systems in Ifana Dean District. I think this is going to be one of the best prepared places in Madagascar, not only to meet the demands of COVID, but also to serve the many other healthcare needs that people have on a daily basis. So um, we have one more short talk uh, 
um, around, of course, COVID. Um, just as a quick introduction, um, I, uh, one of my source of training is in quantitative epidemiology and infectious disease modeling specifically. And um, when COVID uh, emerged, one of the first questions that we all have is how bad is it gonna be? How fast is it gonna travel? Uh, who's at risk? And, um, and how should we respond? And we are flying blind in this space. So the, 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 uh, in, in the West, we're not flying quite as blind as we, we might, it might seem sometimes. Just like Madagascar, the, the testing capability is quite different. So about a year ago, we, we realized that we needed greater scientific capability on the research front to, to be able to respond to all kinds of things. Not like this specifically we had in mind. And we hired uh, Dr. Radu Ropantananari. And he is a, uh, his PhD is in immunology. And as it turns out, presciently, he was working at the plague unit of the Institute Pasteur, which is the national lab. So he started last October before COVID hit. So when COVID emerged, um, it was, we had some ability uh, to respond in collaboration with the partners at Center of Bio. So he's going to talk a little bit about what we can do in response to this very specific situation. Hi, my name is Radra Kutnanari and I'm Pivot's research manager. I have a PhD in immunology and immunopathology. My background is primarily in a lab setting, working mainly on molecular biology and serological assays, as well as quantitative methods in epidemiology. Madagascar's first cases of COVID-19 were reported on March of 2020, and as of now, there are more than 15,000 confirmed cases reported by the Malagasy Ministry of Public Health. Testing capacity is still one of the major issues with the response to this outbreak in Madagascar. There are four laboratories performing confirmation tests by RT-PCR, and all of these laboratories are located in the capital city of Antananarivo. In response to this limited testing capacity, Pivot has been working in collaboration with local partner and research center, the Center of Albio or CVB, to establish an RT-PCR laboratory which would allow for molecular diagnosis of COVID-19 for patients in the region. This would be the first RT-PCR laboratory outside of the capital. This project will help us to increase testing capacity, not only for Ifanatina district, but also for the Vatva Fitfnan region, extending access to vital service for the rural population. It will also reduce the turnaround time of getting test results allowing Pivot and Ministry of Public Health to better manage and mitigate the spread of COVID-19, which, as we all know well, is an imminent threat for public health, especially in places lacking robust public health systems. So, um, as it turns out, uh, Radu already has a uh, publication uh, with some of the, uh, the our other team members and the former Minister of Health. Um, uh, that's actually coming out this week on uh, modeling predictions of COVID uh, in Madagascar and what that might mean for the rest of the continent. So um, I hope this like sheds light in ways that might might be a little clearer than it has been in the past on exactly what the strategy is between uh, the healthcare delivery arm, why why it's so important to have a real system that we understand at the level of a district, which is probably the most important scale at which a health system occurs where there's a hospital, health centers, and community health workers, and how the different components of designing it, delivering it, and data and collection uh, inform those programs. <clears throat> um, so you, you may also be, uh, be familiar with the fact that this has gotten some uh, recognition and um, just last here are these kinds of dreams that we had hoped that this kind of approach to improving care will not only um, not, uh, both advance health as a human right and also finally, hopefully, get like the muscle, the international muscle and resources of the scientific community to understand that like this is the right way to do science. So I just want to say a couple of things about what I think is unique about this. So the, the first thing to say is that what the fundamental principle of the science is that the goal is to improve health outcomes. It's to follow the implementation. 
The second thing that's unique is that the data systems that we have are deep and we integrate them with each other and with the, care, the delivery of the, of the healthcare. <clears throat> now, when we got started, all this seemed quite aspirational. We, we thought science could be important. We understood it needed to follow implementation. We had big hopes and dreams about a laboratory at Center of Bio and collaborating on um, molecular research that might be scientifically important to the entire world and also very interesting and relevant locally. And to be honest, most of the time of the past six years has been marching in the direction of, of both of those dimensions, the, the kind of molecular and sort of base, uh, more basic research and the really important fundamental goals of delivering care. And it's not until now, this now, COVID pandemic, where we realize that all of the muscles that we have as a, as a, as a collective community at Center of Bio, at Pivot, and the Ministry of Public Health, uh, both on the implementation, the infrastructure, and the molecular capabilities. Are, this, is this is what we have been, we are here to do and respond. We finally are in a position to sort of reach these original intentions. So um, that's all there is to say today. <laughs> I hope um, uh, you can see the, the power of, um, of having both the implementation side and corralling this really wonderful scientific ecosystem around this innovative and important work. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm sure you can imagine um, what an honor it is for Matt and me to work alongside this team. It, it really is a source of optimism and hope in a way that gets me up every morning, um, especially during COVID. So we're very grateful for you to be part of our community and for all of the support that you have shown um, I've said to people over the last six months, if a global health organization has to shrink its global health ambitions during a global health pandemic, that's a really sad state of affairs. And, and we very much don't want that to be the case for Pivot. Um, and it doesn't look like it's going to be. Um, your gifts are so generous and so deeply appreciated and they amplify the foundations that are supporting us and some of the underwriting that has happened for Pivot Science to launch. And everything you can give um, goes so far in Madagascar that we, we just thank you for being here and for showing up for people all over the world. So with that, I'll pause and let anyone drop who, who needed to go after the presentation. And we'll take just a couple of moments to, to gather questions and orient ourselves to the Q&A chapter of the evening.